Hi, and welcome to another video in fluid mechanics. Last time, we explored laminar boundary layers, a small layer of fluid near a wall that has a velocity deficit, meaning it has lower velocity than the surrounding free stream. This velocity deficit is caused by viscous forces slowly creeping into the flow. We learned how boundary layers grow in the streamwise direction through disturbance, displacement, and the momentum thickness. We were able to theoretically solve the flow, and with numerical analysis led by Prantl and Blasius, we found the Blasius boundary layer solution. Lastly, the wall shear and resulting drag force was directly solved for. Today, we learn all about turbulent boundary layers. Once the flow is big enough or fast enough, meaning the Reynolds number is high enough, flow transitions to turbulence and becomes unsteady and chaotic in a mess of fluctuations. First, we'll compare the physical behavior of turbulent boundary layers to their laminar counterpart. Then, we can't do much theoretically, so we'll have to use empirical relations to describe the shape and size of the boundary layer. Lastly, we'll use the same procedure as with laminar boundary layers to find the forcing on the wall, or the drag force. Alright, let's jump in. While laminar flows are neat and easier to deal with theoretically, in reality, most flows are actually turbulent. Turbulence occurs when the flow is either very big or very fast. Take some realistic flow examples. An aircraft in cruise is both big and fast, and at a typical cruise velocity, flow transitions to turbulence within 24 millimeters of traveling on the craft. Ship flows are slower, but represent some of the biggest human-made flows on the planet. Within 32 millimeters of seeing the ship hull, flow becomes turbulent. Even much smaller swimmers like fish are mostly turbulent. A tuna, at a typical swimming velocity, is turbulent within 50 millimeters from the nose, and representing turbulence over the majority of the body. Turbulent flows are common, and we need to have a good understanding of them in order to do majority of fluids analysis. So today, we continue our exploration into external flows that we started with the last video, and we study turbulent boundary layers. At a high enough Reynolds number, a boundary layer transitions from calm, clean, and organized laminar flow to rambunctious, messy, and chaotic turbulent flow. This is because the inertia of the flow exceeds its ability to respond to disturbances via the viscous forcing. If you haven't yet, please check out my turbulence video as a more general background. While flow is chaotic and unsteady, there is statistical organization in this turbulent flow. In other words, the flow in the average state is behaved and relatively predictable. Our goal is to be able to predict this average state. The transition is defined by the flow Reynolds number based on the free stream velocity and the distance downstream from where the boundary layer started. This is called the critical Reynolds number, at which point it transitions to turbulence. For a smooth flat plate, this is roughly 500,000. Keep in mind this is an estimate, and varies depending on the surface quality and the incoming flow quality. Let's see what's happening when the flow develops. Consider a uniform flow approaching a smooth, flat plate. Once the flow starts to hit the plate, viscous forces jump into action and start to grow a laminar boundary layer. As the flow moves downstream, this region of velocity deficit gets bigger. Initially, the growth is quite rapid, and then is followed by a longer region of gradual growth where last time we did our laminar theoretical analysis. At some point, at the critical x location, the flow transitions to turbulence. We start to see a lot more unsteady flow structures, vortices, eddies, and chaos. Tracing the boundary layer height with the dashed white line shows us that at the point of transition, the boundary layer thickness jumps dramatically, then gradually continu continues its growth. In the time average, there is an organized and relatively smooth boundary layer profile. Our goal is to be able to define and predict this profile so that we can use it for analysis. Laminar and turbulent flows are inherently different, even statistically. Let's compare a typical laminar and time average turbulent velocity profile. 
On the y-axis, we have the wall normal distance from the wall. Here, we normalize by the disturbance thickness so that, no matter what the boundary layer is, it goes from 0 to 1. On the x-axis, we have the flow mean velocity, where we normalize by the free stream velocity so that these profiles are general in regards to their flow speed. The x-axis also goes from 0 to 1, no matter what the boundary layer is. First, laminar boundary layer profiles are self-similar, meaning they have the sh same shape no matter what, and have been exactly solved for theoretically. Turbulent boundary layer profiles are not exactly self-similar, so their shape does change with certain flow characteristics, but they're relatively similar. Here we show a representative of a turbulent boundary layer. Immediately, we notice stark differences between the profiles. First, the turbulent boundary layer is fuller than the laminar boundary layer. This means that near the wall, there is a much higher velocity in the turbulent boundary layer than its laminar counterpart. As a result, the turbulent boundary layer has higher shear stress at the wall, meaning it pulls on the wall section with a much higher force. This is because the slope of the velocity profile at the wall, the UDY, is much steeper. But why is this? Is there a physical reason behind these observations? Let's consider the structure of a boundary layer on a flat plate. Generally, a basic boundary layer has high velocity at the top and low velocity at the bottom. Now, let's add a bunch of mixing to these smooth streamlines that comes with turbulent flow. What this mixing does is pull the high velocity free stream flow into the boundary layer much more efficiently. And generally, this mixing pushes much higher velocity towards the wall. As a result, turbulent boundary layers with all their mixing and chaos are much more energetic and higher velocity than laminar boundary layers. Now that we've covered the physical behavior, typically at this point we would jump into the theory and have some fun writing our conservation equations and canceling terms based on assumptions. Not today. Turbulent boundary layers, even in the time average, just don't have full analytical or numerical solutions. We would have to deal with the nearly full Navier-Stokes equations, which are famously unsolvable. So we rely on empirical relations. Empirical relations come from collections of measurements and observations in the community. Let's say, for example, we wanted to model the turbulent boundary layer profile. We would need to collect different groups of researchers conducting experiments and simulations at various flow conditions. Once you start to put all the groups work together, you start to see the form of the boundary layer profile. By combining the group results, we can use a best fit or physics-based model to sufficiently replicate the observed behavior. Empirical models are limited in that they only really work for the cases that were studied and cannot be generally applied everywhere, so we need to take care when applying these models to a random flow problem. This represents the limitation of empirical modeling versus true theoretical derivation. Theory is general, which means it applies to a lot of different situations, whereas empirical modeling requires specific data for a specific condition. Okay, let's go over some of the ways we can define properties of the turbulent boundary layer. Before we start, keep in mind that turbulence quantities are represented in the time average. Instantaneously, the flow boundary layer is chaotic and unsteady. We can really only claim to define the time average behavior. This is what sparks the derivations of things like the RANDS equation so that we can analyze turbulence flows, as done in a past video. First, let's take a look at the turbulent boundary layer profile. You might recall from enclosed flows that one of the models we used to recreate the time average flow behavior was something called the power law. This power law relationship works decently well for boundary layers too. The flow profile is a power function, where n is a variable that generally changes with Reynolds number. The power law is pretty good away from the wall. We'll make use of it when we define boundary layer growth and other quantities that deal with the top of the layer. However, the power law is bad near the wall. For example, the shear stress technically goes to infinity because of the slope of the velocity profile. Obviously, we can't have infinity drag, 
so we need a more creative approach for near wall flow properties. This power law is a function to describe the flow velocity profile shape, u as a function of y. To quantify the thickness or height of this profile, we again use the disturbance thickness, the displacement thickness, and the momentum thickness. Recall the general forms of these flow quantities, which we introduced in a previous video. These general definitions apply to both laminar and turbulent flows. Remember, the disturbance thickness is where the velocity pro in the profile is equal to some percentage of the free stream velocity. Here we use 99%. And the displacement thickness and the momentum thickness are based on the velocity and momentum deficits and they require using an integral across the boundary layer to calculate for. Since we're far from the wall when defining these flow characteristics, we can make use of the power law to learn about the flow growth and height. The displacement thickness growth can be solved for directly in the power law and is defined as follows. It's a function of Reynolds number and where you are along the plate, the x location. Additionally, you can make the displacement thickness and the momentum thickness a function of the disturbance thickness and just the power n. Recall n is the power in the power law that is generally a function of Reynolds number. So, knowing just some of the parameters you use to set up the power law to fit your data, you can, in fact, get the thickness and growth behavior. Now let's move on to wall quantities and flow forcing. The wall shear is due to the velocity gradient near the wall. And because we're near the wall, using the power law directly won't help us. But we aren't lost entirely. Recall the general definition of the wall shear from Newton's law of viscosity, which is just a function of the viscosity and the velocity slope at the wall. In addition, we can come up with a second, independent way to find the wall shear. If you consider the boundary layer, the deficit region can be considered a momentum deficit. Physically, the momentum thickness represents a measure of the total momentum deficit in the flow, meaning how much momentum loss there is compared to a uniform profile with no boundary layer. And if we did a free body diagram on the flow or a control volume analysis, the only place the flow feels a force is due to the wall and the viscous shear. So naturally, this momentum deficit change has to be a function of the wall shear. With some relatively simple exploration and dimensional analysis, we could find that there is a simple relation to the wall shear and the spatial derivative of the momentum thickness. And the benefit here is that we now define the flow shear as a function of the momentum thickness, which is something we already know from the power law. Here notice the wall shear is a function of the flow density velocity, and Reynolds number. Interestingly, this equation indicates that the local wall shear decreases as you move further downstream, the same as for a laminar boundary layer. This is because the flow grows and the velocity gradient near the wall lessens as it grows vertically. And as we know, this wall shear leads to a flow creating a force on the plate or surface. Let's take the wall shear and turn it into the wall force, typically referred to as the viscous drag. Generally, the force on the wall due to shear stress is the area integral of the wall shear. This works for both laminar and turbulent flow. If we stick our function for wall shear into this, and we assume our flat plate has some width w, we can get another empirically motivated formula relating wall force to the velocity, density, geometry, and Reynolds number. One important point here is this drag force is only for a single side of the plate. If you have flow on both sides, you need to double it to get the total drag. In aerodynamics and hydrodynamics analysis, people love to represent this in the non-dimensional form called the drag coefficient. We can come to a drag coefficient through the general definition, which we've seen a few times now as follows. If we plug our expression for drag force into this, we get a drag coefficient for a turbulent flat plate boundary layer. I didn't box this because, in reality, it works kind of okay, but we further refine this to better represent reality.
we have a range of Reynolds numbers where one relation works. And at a higher Reynolds number, we have a slightly different formula that works better. Depending on your Reynolds number, you would look at what range you were in and you would find the best relations to define your flow drag. So far, everything we've done today assumes that the flow was entirely turbulent from the beginning of the plate. And for some flows, this is okay. If you have a rough wall, or you had a trip to turbulence at the beginning of your plate, or if you have a super high Reynolds number where the laminar portion doesn't matter, assuming fully turbulent is an okay thing to do. But some flows naturally transition to turbulence, and the laminar portion is meaningful to the flow. To cover these cases, Prantl came up with a more general relationship that accounts for natural transition. And the idea is actually relatively simple. To get the real drag, due to natural transition which has laminar and turbulent behavior, we take the drag from a completely turbulent boundary layer, which we know from above, and we subtract out the turbulence portion that is actually laminar. From zero to x crit, flow is laminar, so you subtract out the turbulence portion from zero to x crit. Then you add back in the drag due to the laminar portion up to x crit. If we apply this to all the relations we found in both the laminar and turbulent boundary layers, we get the following expression for drag coefficient. The result is a more accurate relationship that works relatively well for a large range of Reynolds numbers. To be honest, I'm not really sure why there's an upper bound on the Reynolds number here. Maybe after 10 to the 9 things get a little crazy. Or maybe it's just because 10 to the 9 seems to be the limit of Reynolds numbers we experience in industry on the planet. Either way, in practice you'll make use of relations like these throughout research and industry in fluid mechanics. And in fluid mechanics, laminar and turbulent boundary layers are literally everywhere there is a flow and a surface. Here are some tips to keep in mind when dealing with these boundary layers. First, you need to be aware of your flow state and when flow transitions. Is the Reynolds number lower than RE crit? Is it laminar? Is it turbulent? Is it fully turbulent or partially laminar, partially turbulent? This drastically changes how the flow interacts with the surface. Second, you need to be careful when applying equations in the past few videos. They're good for understanding flow behavior, but not necessarily great for getting exact numbers. For laminar flows, the Blasius solution works fairly well because it was theoretically directly solved for. And for turbulent boundary layers, the power law works okay away from the wall, but we need to be more creative with empirical models near the wall to define the flow forcing. Lastly, these assume a perfectly smooth flat plate. Rarely are flows perfectly smooth, and if there is roughness or bends in your surface, it needs to be accounted for. Especially if your surface is curved, like an airfoil. This curvature leads to pressure gradients that need to be accounted for in analysis. And that's it for turbulent boundary layers. Let's review. We started by describing the general flow behavior of a flow that transitions from laminar to turbulence over a smooth flat plate. The turbulent flow is much more full and energetic than the laminar case, resulting in higher wall shear. We could not approach our flow theoretically, which is impossible, so we relied on empirical observations to build models. Then, we explored the velocity profile shape, the boundary layer thickness, the wall shear, and the wall forcing, which were all calculated in some way from the power law. Also, we covered how to handle the fact that flow transitions from laminar to turbulence naturally, and sometimes the laminar flow matters and needs to be accounted for. Next time, we'll apply what we've been learning about surface forcing and drag coefficients to aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, where our focus will be how the flow forcing impacts objects and vehicles moving through a fluid. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.